Nigeria has a new president, Bola Tinubu, and his tenure has gotten off to quite a rocky start. On May 29th, the day he was inaugurated, he said very suddenly it seemed in a speech that fuel subsidies would go and there was massive chaos in the country, people forming queues. Fuel subsidies is a very important part of uh, Nigeria's economy at this point of time. But also, what? who is Bola Tinubu? What is his agenda? He came to power after a controversial election. We'll be discussing all this with Chiro Onuma, a very prominent Nigerian journalist. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Right. So to begin with, let's get a controversial speech when he said that fuel subsidies must go and the reports say that, you know, there were huge queues. There was a lot of uncertainty about, you know, what would happen. So could you maybe just give us a context of, you know, why did he say that fuel subsidies must go? That too in his inaugural speech. And what is the politics around that? Well, thank you. Uh, the whole concept of fuel subsidy in Nigeria has been a very controversial uh, one. Uh, economists, public analysts, uh, commentators, uh, Nigerian citizens in general have over the years uh, discussed and debated it. It's just a reflection of the sad state of uh, both the Nigerian state itself, but also the problem, the crisis of leadership. So uh, I, for me, when you talk about fuel subsidy, you need to understand the dynamics of, so why do we have subsidy? Uh, Mr. Buhari, who was president from 2015 to just a few uh, days ago, he was president for two terms for eight years. Incidentally, he was the minister of petroleum. Before he came to power in 2015, he had announced publicly, it was one of the things on his campaign trail that fuel subsidy was a scam and that uh, there was no uh, anything as anything like a fuel subsidy. And then he came to power and then debate started all over again. It's, it's just part of the elite control of both the Nigerian economy and the Nigerian state. And you, you don't understand. So when you ask the question, why do you have fuel subsidy? They say it's because Nigeria imports fuel. We have crude oil. So why do we import fuel? We have four refineries in the country. None is working. If you look at the political economy of uh, subsidy and fuel importation, you ask yourself how much trillions of Naira that goes into importing uh, fuel, much of this fuel is diverted. It's the same cronies in big men in government lead capture of the state they, they, they it's they are the ones in control of the state and the ones in control of the petroleum uh, sector and so on so you spend trillions of that according to them naira in subsidizing uh, petrol how much does it cost to build a refinery how much does it cost to fix one or two of the four refineries we have because every year the nnpc the National Oil Company incurs debts for turnaround maintenance of these refineries, for uh, staff salaries and so on, for not doing anything, basically, not producing oil. So I think the whole fuel subsidy thing is just, it's difficult to understand. And then when they talk about petrol being subsidized, making allusion to how much is a liter of fuel in countries like, say, the United States or Canada? You begin to wonder. Fuel subsidy here is not about cars. Fuel in Nigeria is not about fueling your vehicle. Fuel in Nigeria is about the barber, the hair salon, uh, the market women, the hotel, because everything needs generator, alternative source of power to, to function. So even when you increase fuel, you are not just targeting the middle class who own cars. You're targeting the average Nigerian who needs fuel at every juncture in his interaction with the state, his interaction with other citizens. Uh, whether there are no efficient public transport system in the country, there are no alternative transport system like rail, uh, sky train, and even bus effective public 
buses to transport people. So it's it's a difficult uh, period for most Nigerians. For majority of Nigerians, people are already beginning to feel the impact. Uh, prices of uh, the cost of transportation has tripled. And that means the prices of goods and services will triple in the next one week, if not uh, earlier than that. Labor has threatened to call a uh, nationwide strike by Wednesday mid, mid next week. Nobody is certain how all of this is going to pan out, but, but it's really a difficult period for Nigeria. And it's hard to understand why a government that came to power in the midst of general national chaos and discomfort after eight years of terrible rule, misrule of Mr. Buhari Wood in the middle of your inaugural speech, which for me should be a feel-good speech and you know welcoming you to the country, uh, the governance of the country and all of that should in the middle of that statement announce that uh, fuel subsidy would go. Right. And this brings us to a very interesting question, which is of the current president himself, the new president, who uh, he came to power, of course, in elections. Uh, it was a very you know, hotly cont contested elections. Three candidates, including Peter Obi, who was seen as a candidate of the trade unions and was also, according to media reports, very popular among the youth. But we see Bola Tinubu, who is, I believe, also perceived as an establishment candidate, someone who's very deeply entrenched in the political uh, establishment of uh, Nigeria. So could you maybe t tell us a bit about uh, who the new president is, what his agenda is, what is really, what really has he been promising uh, Nigerians and what, you know, what contributed to his victory in the elections? Well, it's a very controversial election and... Uh you're right in saying that the case is still in court, so we don't know how that's going to pan out. Uh, two of the major position candidates, Peter Obi of the Labour Party and Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party, are in court. I think the electoral law says that uh, the case has to be has to end within 180 days from when it starts. So we're hoping that that would happen in the next six months maximum. Uh, but having said that, uh, the man is president. Uh, in the When you look at the speech he gave uh, on Monday, the 29th of May, just, it was just full of platitudes, you know, general thing, we'll do this, we'll, we'll do this. There, there weren't any concrete takeaways as far as I'm concerned. Uh, in part because of the work I do, which which intersects between governance and anti-corruption and accountability, we were looking at uh, very clear statements in terms of his anti-corruption uh, uh, posture and position, because corruption, as many people who uh, are interested in Nigeria know, is a high, hydra-headed monster, which has... Uh, really caused a lot of uh, havoc, both in terms of governance and in terms of development and, and so on. So there wasn't any clear blue, blueprint. Uh, he mentioned something to the effect that uh, they would activate uh, a credit system to tackle corruption, uh, develop the or support the anti-corruption agency. We were looking, in fact, uh, one of the most influential newspapers in the country, the Punch newspapers, came out with editorial was it yesterday or two days ago, tackling him on the need to come out clearly to uh, tackle corruption. Uh, he met with the head of uh, the foremost anti-corruption agency in Nigeria, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, two days ago. Uh, beyond the photo ops, we don't know concretely what the outcome of the meeting uh, is. So. That then plays into the, the man himself. Uh, very little is known. And we as an organization, and when I say we, the organization that I supervise, the African Center for Media and Information Literacy, AFRICME, we also, uh, a day or two after that inaugural address, we, we had issued a press statement uh, asking him to publicly uh, declare his assets constitutionally Every public officer in the country is supposed to declare his asset 
which is domiciled with the code of conduct, uh, the code of conduct bureau. Uh, so we've gone a step further to say he should make his asset publicly. They haven't. Uh, nobody has responded to that. Then it's not likely they would. We did the same for Mr. Buhari, and they uh, they, they ignored us our request. We did the same for Mr. Goodluck Jonathan. Uh, the the man who was president between 2000 and, uh, uh, 2010 and 2015. In fact, in the case of Mr. Jonathan, if I remember correctly, we had written directly to the Code of Conduct Bureau requesting, using the Freedom of Information Act, requesting for that information. And they wrote back to say, oh, they couldn't provide uh, that because the Constitution or the law of the land doesn't uh, permit that, even though the law says there is no clear law that says you have to make the code of conduct or the asset declaration form of public officers, you have to make it public. But it says public officers are supposed to submit their assets. Then there is a freedom of information law which say, which uh, empowers citizens to make requests to make FOI requests to government institutions. So there was no breach, but they ignored us. So uh, we're not sure then if uh, if he's not able to do something as simple as declaring his assets or making it public, how transparent this regime is going to be. And if the regime is not transparent in terms of its, uh, well, in terms of accountability, it's going to be difficult to know how we can ensure good good governance. Other than uh, the fact that he was involved in, in the pro-democracy movement during the Abacha period of uh, 19, uh, 1993 and 98, when Abacha died, then he will return to democracy in 1999 and he became governor. So he became governor for two terms between 1999 and 2007 and the fact that he's been very active politically that's the much we know about the man who is president today very little is known about his background the primary school he attended the secondary school it he attended his university uh, education is in uh, there is a lot of doubt about about that the source of wealth before joining in politics, there is a lot of doubt, you know, about that. So th there is so much uncertainty or things around surrounding him that people right. do not know. And of course, the most important being his health. Uh, you know, he's been in and out of uh, Europe for medical treatment, and he looks quite frail, even at the inauguration. Uh, venue, very many people saw pictures and videos of him, and it's really caused a lot of debate and conversation in the country. So uh, we don't know how all of this is going to affect governance, but yeah, as I said, when I started, it's uh, really, it calls for a lot of worry and Nigerians are concerned. Right. Actually, of course, brother, like you started off by saying, there's definitely a crisis in the country. I believe the unemployment rate is around 33%. Uh, like you yourself mentioned, uh, the kind of impact fuel prices, for instance, or the increase in fuel prices might have on the vast majority of citizens is uh, quite severe. There have been reports of, I believe, migration of workers as well. We are, People's Dispatch itself has done quite a bit on uh, health workers there in Nigeria who are facing a lot of crisis. So, uh, from the government side, from the new government side, has there been any kind, during either during the election campaign or after, has there been uh, you know, any kind of vision of how they want to address some of these issues in a sustainable manner? Not at all, and perhaps we may need to do many more interviews in the days and weeks ahead because uh, the expectation, looking at the eight years of uh, Mr. Buhari and how slow things were, the expectation was that you know this government would tow a different path. Uh, so the government was uh, sworn in on Monday, the 29th of May. It was not just yes until yesterday that it announced its first major appointment. So 
the chief of staff, who is currently the speaker of the National Assembly, who is not likely to resume office until uh, the National Assembly is dissolved later later this month. And uh, then a former minister in the Buhari administration who was appointed secretary to the government of the Federation. Uh, a, a two, three days after he was sworn in, there, there were lots of materials flying around concerning who would be who, ministerial list. Nobody was sure. There were statements coming from his party people, coming from some of his close associates about the nature of the removal of fuel subsidies. Some people were saying, oh, fuel subsidy was re wasn't removed, it wasn't immediate, and so on. So it's also shaking the confidence of Nigerians in the new government. The expectation was that by now, almost a week after there have been, there have been the list of ministers, as I speak, there's yet to be a spokesperson named for the government. So you don't even know who to approach when you want to get information or when you see certain information in the media, who to confirm it or to be sure the source of that information. Uh, we don't know how long it's going to last. Uh, once you don't do that immediately, the expectation is that we would need to see more of the government. He's met with the service chief, uh, according to the news, got briefing on the security situation uh, in the country. We don't know what the plans are. So to answer your question directly, there is no clear blueprint mm -hmm. in terms of general. There are, uh, okay, the only major announcement that has come has been that for those who are seeking foreign exchange, for example, you need to present your tax clearance certificate for three years preceding when you would apply. So it, perhaps it's one way, maybe the whole idea of generating revenue uh, for the states. And again, going back to the economy, there was a news report that they were going to have a unified exchange rate. That caused a lot of storm. Nobody, the central bank came out to deny the statement. The newspaper that reported it said uh, it stood by a story and, and so on. So. There, there is no clarity really where the nation is heading, what specific policy programs and actions the government is going to take on any particular issue, whether it's on health, whether it's on education, whether it's on foreign policy, whether it's on internal uh, security or the economy in general. We're hoping, expecting that maybe perhaps in the days, maybe weeks ahead, that those pronouncements will be made. Hey, Chiru, and finally, of course, a quick question on the overall political climate in the sense that there was there was a sense during the election and even in the previous years that especially after the NSARS protest and then we had the elections in which there was a general interest among the youth. That's what a lot of reports and sources we spoke to said there was a general, you know, there was general interest and rise in uh, if, if, would it be accurate to say that there was a rise in political consciousness and involvement? And if so, what does that imply? Yes, you, those who see that are quite right. I don't think, and I've been involved in the political process around here for over three decades. I, I don't think, maybe perhaps also with the emergence of social media and new information and communication technology, but uh, for some reason, I think uh, Mr. Buhari failed a lot of Nigerians, those who had so much hope in the government. And once after the first four years that the signs were terrible, people began to shift position and started looking up to a new government. And that was the period of the NSAS thing and young people wanted to take uh, their future and the future of the country into their hands. Uh, so there is great interest in the political process in the country, how it's governed, who is doing what. Uh, the, case, the electoral election case is still in court. People, young people participate actively when the case comes up in court and people are still, there are many people who are still hopeful that the courts would uh, decide in the favor of uh, the opposition candidate, Mr. Peter Obi, who they think won uh, the election. So 
it, it's a bit measured now in terms of there's some sense of stability, but how long this is going to last uh, as a very fractured nation, uh, the society is divided. And, and I've said this repeatedly, not since the civil war have we seen the level of division uh, we see in the country uh, today. The, the expectation was that uh, Mr. Tunubu would start immediately to heal these wounds. People have called for the release of Nnamdi Kalu, for example, the head of the group in from the southeast part of the country that's calling for an independent state of Biafra. That hasn't happened. There hasn't been any statement either to that effect. There hasn't been any kind of rapprochement in terms of reaching out to opposition candidates or other people from other parts of the country who feel equally aggrieved or concerned about the outcome of uh, of the election. So it, it's, it's difficult to say how all of this is going to play out, but people are worried, they are concerned, they are interested in the outcome of the current government, but also in the general political outlook of the country. So for example, we'd have to see what one, when is the when labor goes on strike if it does what that means uh so for me the the uncertainty you, you can really feel it in term when you also look at news stories you look at social media you look at the conversations that go on in uh, public buses or public space uh, uh, and so on what yeah, we, we're just, we'll just wait and see how all of this uh, comes together. But certainly that, that there's reason to be concerned and uh, a lot is going to change around here, whether positively or negatively or to what extent. It's what we don't know. Right. Thank you so much, Chiro, for talking to us, for giving us an insight into the very fractious, like you described, political situation in Nigeria. We'll definitely be tracking the uh, worker strike on Wednesday as well as talking, as well as doing reports on that. Thank you for watching People's Dispatch as well.